Hello everybody, it's Sarah and today I have another review for you and that review is sadly not a positive review, it is a negative review, it is in fact of a book that I have so far this year given the second lowest rating. I just didn't enjoy it which is a shame because it was one of my most anticipated reads of the year that was not by an author that I had already previously read. It's a book that I have been somewhat anticipating since 2020 when, you know, sometimes on Twitter you get those notices by authors or by agents when a particular story has been sold to a publisher and I saw this notice of an adult fantasy story that was inspired by Venezuela's history and like Venezuelan inspired, South American inspired and I obviously I am someone who very much enjoys stories that are not your traditionally medieval Anglo-Saxon Western European inspired fantasy stories and so this one excited me um, and I've been waiting for three years basically for this book to be published and I did not go into it with overly high expectations like it wasn't a hyped book for me it was an anticipated book so it wasn't even you know disappointed expectations why I didn't like it but anyway I didn't end up liking it um, and the book that I'm talking about is The Sun and the Void by Gabriela Romero La Cruz which I believe I'm not 100% sure is a debut novel it's at least a debut adult fantasy novel as far as I am aware and it's the first book in a series which is called The Warring Gods. So first before I get into a synopsis and into my thoughts on this story I want to have a few disclaimers I guess and that is that with this book very much um, even though it's a negative review it's a negative review based purely on my enjoyment and on my judgment of the book. So this one is going to be a very like subjective review as all reviews are subjective but what I mean with that is that as far as I read the book I didn't really see any things that I would consider harmful to specific communities. Um, so this is not going to be a full-on rant review, it's just gonna be a basic negative review that actually hurts me that I wanna, like, I wanna talk about this because I did have a lot of thoughts on this that I feel the need to share, but you know, it's not gonna be your full-on fun rant review, that's basically what I wanted to say. And uh, then also that obviously with these types of stories that aren't rooted in my experience or you know close to my experience which I you know a lot of books are but especially when I'm talking about stories like this one that are rooted in marginalized experiences and in histories outside of the west there might be a lot of things that I have missed with this book and because of that I enjoyed the book less. The only thing that I can do with this review is share my own experiences and so take what I'm saying at least with a little bit of a grain of salt basically is what I want to say. So yeah with that out of the way let's talk about uh, what this is about. This is set in a I hate using this word because in an academic sense it's just like imprecise to be honest but this is set in a post-colonial region I'm gonna call it because I believe it's set in two different countries and uh, within this region you know you had colonizers coming colonizing people mostly non-human races so the oppressed people are non-human races within this story and then about I believe 50 years ago there was a big war and the colonizers left but of course they left their legacy they left people there like just because the colonizing nation left doesn't mean all of the people left because obviously the people that were born there and growing up there etc um, stayed there and also they left their society because that's just what happens with colonization. And while the colonizers left, the non-human races within this region are still treated pretty 
badly and so you have two different races that I forgot the names of basically one have like deer horns and the other one have tails <laughs> That's, oh, right, I remember. I think one was the Nosariel and one was like the Velcra or something along those lines, something with V. And so our two main characters are from these two races. One of the two of them had a human father and a Nosariel mother. And after both her mother and father are dead, she gets a letter from her grandmother telling her to come to her. Uh, on the way there she braves a lot of danger and once she finds her grandmother she finds out that her grandmother wanted her to come for a very specific reason and that maybe there's like there's some intrigues that her grandmother is spinning. The other character that we follow is a Velcra or Velcro I forgot what the they are called. They're the dear people in my mind, basically. And she has grown up within a human family. She does not know who her father is. Her father is her non-human parent. And so because she's non-human, she has been treated like shit, basically, within her family. And now the matriarch of her family is trying to marry her off. However, she does not want that. And so she tries to escape her fate. And during the course of the book, the stories of the two main characters obviously join. Also, this story is sapphic. So I just had to turn my light on and since it's been a few weeks since I finished the story, I'm just pulling up uh, my review that I put up on NetGalley from this. I did also, by the way, I did get an e-arc of this story and I did also read it early because I had the Illumicrate edition, which by the way, it hurts me so much that I did not like this book because the like the Illumicrate edition is so fucking pretty. Um, but anyway, I started the story and right off the bat, I was just, I was not convinced. Like the writing generally did not convince me. The writing, it's not bad writing by any means, but it's very what I call tool-like writing. So it's the type of writing that is simply and purely there to tell the story. It's not there to enhance the story. It's not there to enhance the vibes. It's simply there to put words on a page so you get the story. And some people like the type of writing. I don't mind the type of writing, but I don't particularly enjoy it. And the bad thing, the negative thing was, while I was also reading this, I was rereading, I actually have it right here, The Liar's Not at the same time. Now, the Rook and Rose series is, by now, not at a right the third book, my favorite series of all time. It has, in my opinion, immaculate writing. It doesn't have the most beautiful or purple prosy writing out there, but it's writing that very much is used to enhance the story. And so I thought that with how much I love this series, by the way, um, there's still a full review of the series coming, with how much I love this series, I thought, you know what, maybe in comparison, this one just doesn't hold up and that's why I'm not enjoying it. However, I did notice the more the story went on that no, I just have a few very fundamental issues with this story. And so I ended up giving it 1.5 stars. But let me put this in the back right now and let me tell you why exactly I had such big issues with the story. So it's gonna be kind of hard for me to tell you what my issues were exactly without sharing examples and without sharing spoilers. But um, let's start where I started in my Goodreads review as well, and that was the characters. And there's just not much to say for the characters. Both POV characters were not engaging at all for me and neither were any of the side characters. A lot of times, even if I don't feel particularly drawn to the main characters, I at least latch onto one or two side characters. That happened to me, for example, with A Taste of Gold and Iron by, I forgot the author name right now. I did not really care about the two main characters, the two POV characters. However, I really enjoyed quite a few of the side characters. With this book, not at all. I did not care about the main characters. I did not care about the side characters. They were very, very flat and just not 
three-dimensional at all. I did not, like, I could not engage with their struggles whatsoever. Like, I mean, part of that was also that one of the characters fell into a trope that I just personally don't like and don't enjoy following like the whole story of oh my god i am forced to marry someone who i don't want to marry well you know i understand the whole thing and i understand why some people find it an appealing storyline i just don't really necessarily find that storyline appealing and i find it kind of overdone in most cases so yeah, that was just not an appealing storyline for me and for the other character. For me, it was just really hard and really difficult to figure out that character's motivation. And part of the reason why I had such a struggle connecting to the characters was to do with the way the plot was set up. And that is that we had just very big time jumps in between some scenes and in between some chapters and within those time jumps basically a lot happened in terms of character progression and in terms of plot progression and in terms of decisions made and in terms of character relationships moving on and so the scenes quite often felt very disjointed and just the character progression felt disjointed and it was sometimes like like in the last chapter this character was still completely different like and thought x thing was a bad idea why are they suddenly for this why between one chapter and the next are those two characters suddenly the best of friends like that was also my main thing with the romance for example we have this very central sapphic romance that is set up at the beginning of the story but it's not really properly set up. Like, I mean, sure, when one of the characters first sees this other character, um, it's like very quickly described that this character thinks she looks very angelic. And I was like, okay, right, this, this like romance is being set up. However, by the next time that we see the two of them, the like she's already completely infatuated with the character but we don't really see a slow build up we don't really see a like a progression it's not set up properly at least like it's it's slightly set up but not properly i we don't really like i personally did not really understand why this character was like all about the grandmother and the ideas of the grandmother and why she just went along so much with her grandmother i mean i did get it like we were told why it was that way and it was basically because this character didn't have anywhere else to go but in terms of showing all of that like in some scenes in how the character is struggling internally or whatever there was almost nothing there, at least not enough for me. And that I think is my biggest issue with the story, with the characters and with the plot, that there was a lot of telling, not showing. And see, personally, I am someone who says there's no hard and fast rules for writing. I can tell you right off the bat, probably five books that do telling, not showing, that I absolutely love and that I think do that well. As an example, I think Babel by R.F. Kuang, which is over there somewhere, does more telling than showing in a lot of scenes and in a lot of instances. However, I think the way it is done, I personally enjoy. Not everyone will enjoy it, but I personally enjoy it. I also talked about that in my review of Babel. However, within this book, telling but not showing was exactly implemented in the way where so many writing coaches and writing seminars and workshops and books and handbooks and whatever say you shouldn't use it. It was done in a way where it didn't invoke any feelings. It was just like, you're given this, here's the information, make with it what you will, uh, you're just supposed to believe this now. But there was nothing there. It was just like, well, I don't, I don't believe that though. I, I don't really believe that she just fell in love with her. I don't believe why, like, 
And there was an instance with another character where she in one scene was still really infatuated with this person but by the next scene had found out that this person isn't as great as she originally thought that person was. But we did not see her finding that out. We're given the information that something happened in between where, you know, the, the rose-tinted glasses kind of, you know, slipped off. But that was it. I would have loved to see that scene. And it's one of those things where it feels like there's only scenes in the story that are of importance to the finale of the book and of importance to getting to the finale. And it just makes this book feel very bare bones because a lot of times it's the little scenes that seem kind of unnecessary and that seem like you could cut them out that are so important for character building, for motivations, etc. And so yeah, I just did not enjoy the characters. Something that I also wrote in the review was that the characters seem to pretty much only interact with each other when the scenes are important to the plot. That's what I just said. It's what particularly was noticeable with the romance and it was why I just did not care about the romance at all. Then in terms of the plot there were just a lot of elements that I just... I just found the plot to be pretty boring and I, I can't go into what my biggest issues were with the plot because then I would you know, spoil something, but let me just say that it was really obvious what was going to happen towards the end in terms of one particular item. Um, it was really obvious that this was going to happen because obviously this is gonna happen, but it wasn't set up and it didn't make sense why this happened. Like, it just happened because it was a fantasy trope, but it had nothing to do with the characters or with the story or with the world building that was set up. And then that's also what I want to say about the world building. Same with the plot and same with the characters. The world just didn't feel lived in. It just... like I couldn't really get a grasp on what the magic is and how the magic works. And personally, I am not someone who prefers hard magic systems over soft magic systems. I know that the tendencies currently a lot of times go towards hard magic systems, especially among high fantasy readers. I usually actually prefer soft magic systems, um, which doesn't mean that the magic system doesn't have rules, but you know that it's all a bit more vague. Because um, what I notice is that authors who use soft magic systems often implement them within the world and the world building more in a way that is to my liking compared to hard magic systems where a lot of the focus is often just on the rules rather than how this magic system interacts with the broader world. Um, with this one I had neither to be honest like I didn't really I, I kind of like we got information how the magic system interacts with the world but once again I didn't feel it it didn't it didn't appear with the way how the characters interacted with the world in my personal opinion um it was once again all just very bare bones there was hardly any explanation how this magic system works we know it's based on metals that's basically it um yeah I don't know there, there wasn't that much there. Uh, there is part of the thing where I'm gonna say, okay, it could be that I'm just missing context because personally, obviously, I do not have the possible historical or cultural context that the author has. So maybe there's part of the reason there. Um, then also, once again, uh, this is a world where pretty recently, I'm just going to my review because I don't remember what, what exactly my feelings were, um, but this is a pretty recently post-colonial um, region and like at least one of the characters or the side characters played a major role within the overthrowing of the colonial government 
it did not really feel like that played a lot into the story itself. Aside from the fact that you now have characters that are oppressed. But again, it just feels like those characters were oppressed because you just have um, oppressive systems within a fantasy story. It kind of felt like fantasy sexism in a way, um, where it didn't really feel like it was vital to the story or like it was explored within the story. And with fantasy oppression, fantasy racism, fantasy sexism, whatever, I, I do prefer that to be there for a reason. <laughs> personally. I don't find it particularly interesting to follow characters who are oppressed uh, just to have characters that are oppressed to give them that backstory or whatever. To have other characters constantly throwing insults at them. I just... it doesn't interest me. I think it's like especially if you're a marginalized author I think it's understandable why you write it but to me personally that's just not an interesting story uh, to read and yeah I, again it just didn't feel like this this colonial history was in any way explored that is not to say that you can't have a colonial history within your story but you know just not my preferred world building again th the same the same thing also it, it's something that I recognize and I think something that can be used very intentionally and if it's used very intentionally I do love it but I tend not to love the allegory of non-human races for ex marginalized identity if it's if it's just to be there as an allegory and if there's nothing done with it and again it just didn't feel to me like there was anything done with that within the story so it just I wanted so much more from the story, but it just it just wasn't there. And for me, again, a lot of the elements of the story with racism, with sexism, with queerphobia, um, like all the isms, bigotry, whatever, I... like most of the books that I really, really love, that are some of my favorite books, have those things in their stories. However, they use them and they utilize them in very, very intentional ways and pick them apart and within this story it felt like it was just there it was just there because that's part of the world building i guess and again i think maybe part of the reason why i just didn't like it a lot maybe also just has to do with disappointed expectations because with the setup of the story the story that is very recently post-colonial i just love the exploration of then pre-colonial structures, of trying to get back to them, of trying to explore what colonialism does to a society. And that's not what this book gave me. And that is okay. <laughs> it is completely okay. Again, it just meant that this book wasn't the book for me. Uh, so, you know, I think the flat characters and whatever, those were just a lot more general and maybe objective although again what what is objective in a review um criticisms that i have of the story and a lot of the stuff that i'm saying now is just you know i expected this i wanted this and it just didn't give it to me and similarly also with the exploration in terms of the pre-colonial society the only thing that we know is that there were three fantasy races, one of them was actually wiped out, so now we only have two anymore, and those three fantasy races lived completely separately from each other. Which, yeah, I, I guess that's a legitimate way to have world building. It's, once again, just not interesting to me. And it also doesn't make sense in terms of my last criticism of the story which i have to go a bit more in depth on i guess and that is the religion because for some reason there's still only one pre-colonial religion if you have three different races with three different cultures that live completely separately from each other why do you have only one religion doesn't make sense and then you also have a second religion which is kind of um christianity based like you have as a central figure, um, a holy virgin, 
which I think definitely makes sense and it also definitely makes sense in the sense of South America because as far as I know and as far as I remember uh, in a lot of the you know kind of syncretized but like the very specifically South American iterations of Christianity um, or the way Christianity is lived nowadays in South America uh, Mary does play a very central role so you know it's it's pseudo fantasy Christianity we get that in pretty much every fantasy book I don't really care about that the other thing though is the second religion that we had which is the pre-colonial religion which also to me felt very Christianity based uh, which I will admit right now may very much be due to me not knowing enough about pre-colonial Venezuelan indigenous religions um, or generally South American indigenous religions. However, as far as I know, most of them, like most of the ones that I'm aware of, at least somewhat, are polytheistic. Um, so you have multiple different gods, sometimes also like animism type of elements. So animism is everything where you have a nature that is alive or any type of religion where you kind of have a soulful nature to a certain extent. This second religion was very much two deities. One is all good, one is the counterpart that's all bad. The one that's all good can create living things. The one that's all bad can't create anything himself and because of that is very jealous. Which, I don't know, maybe that's just me, but that's also very, very Christianity coded for me. Which, again, and here I might just be talking out of my ass. So I'm not saying that this is harmful or problematic or whatever. I'm just sharing my thoughts right now. But having a pre-colonial religion in a fantasy story and that being influenced by Christianity or being inspired by Christianity, which again, I'm not saying it is, it's just the way it reads to me, but I don't have a lot of information on all those religions, again, as I said, so if it is, big if, then that just seems kind of weird to me. I get it because like religion in terms of pre-colonial religions didn't always survive and in a lot of ways most of the time quite often got syncretized. I mean we see that even within our history in Europe, right? Because with a lot of Norse mythology, uh, because it was basically written down after Christianization, we don't really know how much of that mythology is actually syncretized and Christianized and whatever. And so, you know, there, there, there's a lot of caveats and so in what I'm saying right now. But it's still, it just, it just seems so strange to me to have this like very, very, again, Christian coded, for me at least, religion be a pre-colonial religion when considering the history of South America. It just, it just seems weird to me, okay? It just gave me weird vibes. I'm not saying it's harmful or it's, I'm not saying it's problematic at all. It's just, it's just thoughts basically <laughs> that I'm sharing. I think that was all, but this has already been a very long review. I think for other people who have other stuff that they enjoy about high fantasy compared to me, I am very much, like very, very much a very world building, society world building heavy reader. I think for other people they will enjoy the story more, but for me there was just on all levels, characters, plot, world building, there wasn't really anything positive about it. Uh, like the only reason I gave it 1.5 stars and not one star is because while I didn't particularly enjoy my experience reading it, I also didn't absolutely hate it and felt like I only wanted to DNF it or whatever. So that's why I gave it 1.5 stars. But overall it was just a disappointing read and so yeah, I 
will leave you at that. Tell me in the comments down below, do you still want to pick the story up if you haven't read it? If you have read it and maybe enjoyed it, share in the comments down below why did you enjoy it? So maybe people watching this can go into the comments and see if, you know, maybe the people who enjoyed it have similar tastes to them or similar reasons to why they sometimes enjoy books. And if you enjoyed this video, maybe think about giving me a thumbs up and also maybe subscribing and all the links to my social media as well as to my book club of Queens, Witch and Valkyries, where one adult high fantasy book written by a woman or gender queer person per month will be left linked down below. So go and check those out. And I hope I'll see you very soon. Bye.